So why are teeth getting more and more crooked? Why is malocclusion happening? And I have a number of proposed, I actually documented reasons, a number of proposed reasons that is my personal opinion, but you see the big picture here. Number one, it's been clear that as our diets change from hunter-gatherer status to agri agriculture, that we not, we're not chewing or using our mouths as much as we used to. Uh, so that, I think the anthropologists and dentists have shown that this has made major changes. Uh, here's another, another anthropologist, and in this century, in the 1950s, he, he studied these isolated communities in Kentucky. One community had high, um, high rates of uh, chewing hard foods, and the other community had, was eating soft foods. What he found was that communities that ate hard foods had better occlusion and less cavities. Um, you may not know about this book, but this is a major eye-opener for me. Uh, Consider the Fork by B. Wilson, History of How We Cook and Eat. There's one chapter on knives that's really fascinating. Do you know about this? So he, she mentions um, Dr. Lauren Brace. He's an anthropologist who studied primitive skulls. And what he found was that modern overbite, and he comments other dentists, that, that modern overbite only happened about two to three hundred years ago. That before that, we had edge-to-edge -edge bites. But as cultures start to adopt uh, cutting tools, and you can imagine only the rich people could afford cutting tools, right? So across the board in England and China, he found that the rich people had um, overbites first. Um, actually, in China, it was much earlier than that, like a thousand years before that, because um, they had what's called a Tao or two cutting knife. And so in China, I guess they chopped the meat before they brought it to the table, whereas in England, they chopped it or cut it um, on the table. I think the Chinese thought that cutting meat on the table was primitive. Now, this is a, a standard picture of a Jamaican woman. And you'll see a lot of Jamaicans, for some reason, have these beautiful smiles, right? So look at, look at the width of her, her jaws, and no black spaces at the corners of her mouth. Um, one of the OR nurses that I used to work with um, at Montefiore, she grew up in St. Kitts, which is a very small island in the Caribbean. And she said that when they grew up, they used to make, they made, they made fun of rich people because they had crooked teeth, <laughs> which goes along with what I'm talking about here. And then, of course, Dr. Brian Palmer. I mean, he, is, he, he basically just opened my eyes to this whole concept along with Dr. Mu and also Bill Hang in California. So these are my three mentors. Um, I won't go into his, actually I would strongly recommend everyone go to his website and download all his presentations before it gets taken off. Hopefully the people that's trying to keep it running will succeed. And this is just one slide from his website showing that, uh, like what Lisa was saying, basically the nipple, the breast conforms to the baby's mouth, whereas it's vice versa with the bottle. The, bo the baby conforms to the bottle. Okay. So obviously thumb sucking has been documented to cause or aggravate malocclusion and crooked teeth. Pacifiers. <laughs> this is from Paula Fabi. <laughs> Nasal congestion is a major factor for malocclusion. And that's one thing that I really, really emphasize is to optimize nasal breathing. And this is a very popular common slide you see all over the place on the internet by Dr. John Mew. I think it's called the Jerva boy. The one on the left is the boy at 10 years old, and then at 17, so he got a gerbil for his birthday, and then he had nasal congestion. This is how his face developed. Now, um, and then with kids, tonsils and adenoids, this is something that we do in our field all the time. And this can be from large adenoids, large tonsils, or both. In some kids have very large lingual tonsils. And that kind of goes hand in hand with small jaws. Now, I'm going to add one more piece of the puzzle and this may be a little bit controversial with all the dentists here. I'm going to propose that maybe fluoride, even though it helps to prevent cavities, may be actually making things worse. So let me show you the evidence. So um, this is a study looking at rats. And what they did was they put powder expanders on rats. So pregnant rats and normal rats. And they, I think they did it for about three days. And what they showed was that, here, the pregnant rats, they expanded 0.64 millimeters. The control groups had 0.46, whereas this uh, fluoride-treated rats had only 0.22. That was pretty significant. So when you're pregnant, I guess the hormonal changes causes more expansion of the jaws, um, whereas the fluoride helps to, it kind of prevents um, 
bony growth rate and expansion. Now, one thing, one personal note is that when I was in training in residency, I prescribed a lot of sodium fluoride to treat what's called orosclerosis, which is an inner ear, middle ear problem where you have overgrowth and the piston just stiffens so it doesn't vibrate. And so if it's really bad, you have to offer surgery, and these are really amazing operations. But if it's very mild, what we did was we offered sodium fluoride to prematurely harden the bone so that it doesn't get worse, and then do surgery later if it doesn't, if it doesn't work. And so you have to ask yourself, if you give sodium fluoride for this condition or drink water, is it going straight to the ear and the teeth only, or is it going anywhere else? Right? And here's another study looking at sodium fluoride on powder development. Um, and they found that in embryonic rat palates, um, when you get fluoride, it doesn't fuse properly. Okay. Another, uh, lots of other papers showing that it affects um, collagen expression, collagen 1 expression. And that affects bone and cartilage. Okay. And here's another scary study. There's a huge meta-analysis on fluoride consumption done by Harvard, showing that communities with higher levels of fluoride had significantly lower IQ levels. This is not just for humans, it's also in animals. So this is a book by, I think, uh, Judy Hoy. Her book is called Changing Faces, and she's an environmentalist, naturalist, somewhere in the uh, Midwest. And what she was finding was that she was finding a deer and all these other ruminants that had major malocclusion, where the upper jaw was not developing fully. Now with ruminants, they don't have upper teeth. They have what's called a dental pad, so the lower teeth have to grab onto the dental pad to, to pull grass and, and leaves to eat. But if the upper jaw doesn't develop properly, then it just it has nothing to touch. So these animals would be malnourished and get really sick. And she was relating it to the um, pesticide uh, spraying upstream or down up, upwind um, with, these, with the farming areas. Now, we all know what the consequences of all these conditions are, at least to sleep apnea. And millions of people have their lives improved by using CPAP, but obviously um, not everyone can tolerate CPAP. But what about what, ha what happens if you get if you have these symptoms and you do a sleep study and you're told you don't have sleep apnea, right? Just like what many of our speakers talked about. So this is a nasal, oral airflow, and chest and abdomen. So notice how there's no airflow in the nose or the mouth, but you're breathing. You make an effort to breathe. And one bar is four seconds. This is a 30 second epic, so this is 10 seconds. Four bars is 10 seconds. Now here, you have um, no oral flow, but some nasal flow. And this is what a hypopnea is. You have partial obstructed breathing for more than 10 seconds. And you also have your oxygen dropping more than 3% from 97 to 84. So, and then the other criteria, what. Um, Vic was talking about is that you have to have brainwave arousals for hypopnea. It's very technical definitions. But the way you diagnose sleep apnea is based on the apnea hypopnea index, which is apneas plus hypopneas per hour. And each episode has to be 10 seconds or longer. But if you stop breathing 25 times an hour for nine seconds each, what's your score? Zero. Now, this is the classic paper by Dr. Gimeno who described this phenomenon called Upper Airway Resistance Syndrome, 1993. And what he did was he studied young, healthy, thin men and women who were tired all the time but didn't have sleep apnea. And what he did was he put in, this is a sleep study, but he also put in esophageal pressure probes to measure the pressure in the chest cavity. And you'll see that this is a nasal flow. Um, I'm going to show here, this is normal breathing. Notice it's more rounded. But as they start to obstruct, it gets flatter and flatter. See that? With each successive breath in, the pressure in the esophagus gets lower and lower and lower and lower. And at this point, the brain waves wake up. So this is what's called flow limitation, which doesn't meet the criteria for hypopneas or even reras.